Hey guys, here's part two of our video series on how we built our backyard hockey shooting pad. If you haven't seen part one of this series, which includes a time lapse of the entire build, I encourage you to do so to get an overview of the project. This video will focus on the planning and design process used to plan the entire project. I'll cover the process used for researching design ideas, designing the pad itself, the materials and tools that were needed to complete the entire project, and some lessons that I learned along the way to help in your project. Be sure to check out the remaining parts of the video to get a detailed walkthrough of the build. But before we can build, we need to have a solid plan. And that's what this video is all about. So let's talk about planning. Alright, first let's talk about research. Since I'm not a carpenter, I needed to do a lot of research into building platforms that could accommodate a shooting pad. I knew it was a blend of building a deck or the base of a shed. Fortunately, I found some excellent resources on the web that to me offered good practices I could use for this project. YouTube was the best resource for finding this information quickly and a video is worth a thousand photos. So thanks to these channels or individuals for their videos, you'll see that I took many design cues from these videos, which so far have met our requirements. YouTube wasn't enough though. I also needed to do quite a bit of research on the web to get some more detailed information such as techniques for fastening plywood and a very important step was to research the manufacturer of the plywood purchased to determine what type of fasteners were needed to work with their product and avoid corrosion issues. In my case, the pressure treated wood was manufactured by a company called Micro Sienna and I must say their website was excellent and provided clear specifications on which fasteners to use. In our case, we went with stainless steel, but more on that later in the video. Next step was to design the pad. This is just a summary of the requirements that we had going into the project. First, I knew I needed a stable and level platform capable of holding kids and adults simultaneously. Since the platform was outdoors and the fact that we live in Canada with some pretty extreme weather, the materials used needed to be durable. I'll be happy if it lasts 10 years or until the kids end their minor hockey careers. I also wanted something that was relatively low maintenance. I think maintenance free is unrealistic but I did deliberate things to avoid issues that can arise with these types of platforms like weed and animal control that some designs lack which end up costing time in the long run. I also wanted to maximize the size of the pad. I figured the more space, the more flexibility and value of the pad. And lastly, I wanted to keep the pucks on the pad, so designing some type of sideboard was important as well. And again, more on that in the next few slides. An important part of the design was knowing what type of shooting tile we were going to use. Note these are not synthetic ice tiles that you can skate on. Those tiles are much more expensive compared to non-synthetic ice tiles and I figured our pad wasn't large enough to accommodate synthetic ice in a practical sense. Back to the shooting tiles though, so we considered three manufacturers and ended up selecting BetterHockey.com. If you want to learn more about the comparison of the tile manufacturers and why we selected BetterHockey.com, check out part 5 of this video series which is dedicated to the subject. The dimensions of the tiles were important to design the pad so that it could fit as many tiles as possible with the space that we had. In our case, the tiles were 18 inches by 18 inches and with the space we had, we calculated a pad of 7 tiles wide by 14 tiles long or roughly 220 square feet of space. I designed the pad to be a few inches wider and longer to provide space for expansion. I really don't know if this is a significant risk, uh, that is of, of expansion, with these types of tiles, but I factored it in nonetheless. Okay, next step was to produce a design that I could use to determine what types of materials I would need and to identify the steps needed to build it. I had never done this before, so I just used the tools that were available to me. In my case, I used the Numbers spreadsheet software on my Mac to produce this design. The design was based primarily on a floating deck concept. This means the platform is not anchored to the ground. The foundation is made up of 12 solid concrete blocks which the platform rests or floats on. But trust me, uh, there's no floating going on. It's very stable. I like this design because it appeared to be a commonly used and sound approach and was simple and cost effective to build. For example, each concrete block was $2 and I didn't need any special tools to install them. Now sitting on top of the blocks are three very thick 4x4 four four inch lengths of wood called skids that act as beams to distribute and stabilize load. 
Uh, it's worth mentioning that I, I had to join two pieces of four by four inch lumber together to create each skid as they're a little over 21 feet in length. You just can't purchase these uh, in, in that kind of length. So I had to support the butt to butt joint by placing a square, sorry, a spare interlock stone I had from a previous project under the joint to support it. Uh, the skids provide an excellent foundation for the floor joists that are installed perpendicular to the skids, 16 inches on center, which support the plywood floor. Now having completed the project, I can say that the design was very accurate and not once that I have to go to the store to get missing material. I can also say that having used the pad for some time now, uh, the design is very solid and I'm confident it's going to last. Okay, here's a, a, a cutout diagram that shows what the platform looks like from the top uh, to the bottom when you're looking at it as if you would be looking at it sideways. Um, this was helpful to determine how deep I needed to dig at the highest side of the slope to position the concrete blocks and also to help understand how the materials were interacting with an, one another. I had about a five inch slope from the very highest to the lowest uh, position on the platform just to, as an FYI. The more you can understand before putting the shovel in the ground the better in my opinion and this view also informed the size of sideboard or bumper that I would need. Um, one thing I hear, I wish I would have used a higher sideboard, but I decided to use deck boards and the widest I could get them was a two inch by six inch piece. Ideally a two inch by eight inch board would have been better. All right, let's talk building materials. Uh, this really surprised me a lot. I had no idea I would need so much material to build the pad. Uh, but when I was going through the design using the spreadsheet, it really helped to identify the materials needed. I won't go through the entire list. It's included here for you to see. Uh, you can pause the video and, and get a good look at uh, the different types of materials and the quantities that I needed. A few key points to call out about the materials. All of these should be available from uh, the big box home improvement stores such as Home Depot or Lowe's. However, I found a, a big difference in, in price on fasteners when compared to local providers. In some cases, hundreds of dollars difference. So if an item appears overpriced like stainless steel screws, uh, check your local building suppliers. A big box store was charging me uh, several hundred dollars for screws that I ended up purchasing uh, for $75 at a local building supplier for screws of equivalent quality. Planning these details in advance using the spreadsheet was essential for estimating the materials needed and the plan was 100% accurate. As I said, I did not have to go back to the store to get additional materials. Doing all this planning on paper here or in the spreadsheet really helped identify those materials. Okay, next up is uh, the netting used for the project. I did a lot of research on different types of netting that could be used for a hockey shooting pad. There are a lot of companies out there that sell netting in retail stores and online as well, but most uh, of these sell netting in pre-cut sections like, for example, 10 feet by 10 feet. It would have been difficult for me to patch these sections together to cover uh, our needs without having a lot of wasted material and wasted money. So I was fortunate to find a, a company called MyBackyardIceRink.com which manufactures custom sized netting of all different types, shapes, and sizes. I sent them my, dimen my dimensions and they gave me several options to choose from, all with many different features such as, uh, just as an example, with or without eyelets uh, and many more uh, features. I looked them up online and they appeared to have a good reputation so I ordered the net. It took about three to four weeks to get here which is a long time. However, COVID certainly impacted the delivery times and the company did advise me of longer delivery times when ordering. I was a bit nervous of ordering a custom fitted net sight unseen online, but now after having installed it, I need to give major props to mybackyardicerink.com for delivering the netting exactly to spec. The net fits perfectly, it doesn't sag, and it is a very high quality. I've ripped uh, pucks on it pretty hard, you know, slap shots uh, as hard as I can, and so far, absolutely, uh, absolutely no signs of stress, but it's early days. Uh, I'm curious to see how uh, the netting is going to weather, but the netting has been UV treated and is designed to be used outdoors for hockey purposes, so it should last a long time. One aspect of shopping for nets that's worth mentioning here is the color of the net itself. Uh, people may not think about this, but I did research black versus white colors, 
and found research that showed that when looking through a net, our eyes will see past a black net more easily versus white netting. It's difficult to explain, but, but think about it, most outdoor nets are black and that's because they're less visible to the human eye versus white netting and having installed ours in black I can tell you that this is true the net is not distracting at all. To fasten the netting I also looked at many options and settled on zip ties. I checked with the netting manufacturer and they concurred this was an acceptable solution for their product Zip ties don't require any tools or drilling, so they're very easy to install. And since they're made of plastic, will not rust over time. The only question is how they will weather over the years, but even if I need to replace a few, they're inexpensive and easy to replace. I used approximately 150 of them for the project, but again, uh, relatively inexpensive and uh, wasn't an issue, much cheaper than uh, harder or, or steel fasteners. This is a list of all the tools I use to build the project start to finish. As you can see, most of these tools are common household tools. I happen to have all of them, so I didn't have to purchase any new ones, thankfully. I need to mention, though, uh, and again, that I'm not a carpenter, so the tools I have are pretty medium to low end, and they did the job. The only tool that I needed to borrow from a neighbor was a corded variable speed drill when drilling in the subfloor. With the amount of screws needed, I had uh, several hundred screws that needed to be fastened. My, I'll say, low-end cordless drill was struggling to maintain its charge and I only have one battery which made it that much more difficult. The weather also didn't help. At the time that I installed the, the subfloor we had sub-zero Celsius temperatures uh, here in Canada when I was building the pad and lithium batteries do not respond well to the cold which put more stress in the battery. Uh, but when I switched to and the corded drill, it really fixed all these issues and uh, I could drill all day with that thing and I highly recommend corded if you can get one for this type of project, especially when screwing in subfloors, which I'm sure uh, would drain most uh, uh, cordless drills pretty quickly. And for me, having that plugged in electric drill uh, was uh, fantastic. All right, lessons learned for this phase of the project all comes down to taking the time to produce a plan. I spent about the same amount of time planning the project as I did building it, and I'm sure glad that I did. Uh, this process really uh, avoided many mistakes by planning the pad on virtual paper using my spreadsheet software, which allowed me to try a lot of different ideas to really di dial in the design and make mistakes without any consequences. Uh, I, I can't stress this enough. Avoid the temptation to put the shovel in the ground and just wing it. Uh, I even wrote down the instructions step by step which helped rehearse the build and for me doing that even identified some materials that I had missed in my case which ended up saving me extra trips to the store. The instructions that I had written were accurate and they really kept me focused during the project. You know when you're doing these kinds of things there's a lot of things going on. There's kids running around you know. Uh, it's very easy to get sidetracked and then to miss a step. And in my case, following those instructions step by step really, really helped and also helped track my progress along the way. Another lesson that was learned was about pressure treated wood and the fact that the chemicals used in treating the wood can and will corrode and compromise certain types of fasteners. Uh, a quick search on the manufacturer's website identified the specs for the types of fasteners that were needed in my case, which were stainless steel. Uh, and uh, lastly, compare prices of the big box stores to local suppliers. It takes more time for sure, but in my case, it saved me hundreds of dollars. So that was an overview of the process used to plan and design the hockey shooting pad. If you're interested in learning more about other phases of the project, please check out the other parts of the video. I hope this was helpful and I wish you all the best with your project.